We are in Ruth 3, Ruth chapter 3. And we will seek to finish the chapter today. We dealt with the opening five, chapter, five verses of the chapter last week. And there's one scene really before us from verse 6 through 18. So we'll endeavor to lay that scene in its unity before you. And may the Lord give us understanding even as we read the word together and seek to expound it before you. Ruth chapter 3, we'll commence reading at verse 6. And she went down onto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. It came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth. Lie down until the morning. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. And he said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. Also he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley, and laid it on her, and she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me. For he said unto me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. Amen. Ending there. The end of Ruth chapter 3. And briefly, once again, beloved, let us seek the Lord in prayer. Our God, we all have personal needs, and thou knowest very well. Thou alone art able to meet us at the point of our need. And so, as always, when we come to the Word, there is this cry, this inner longing, Dear God, teach me thy way. Feed me upon thy Word. Let me see Jesus. O oh God, we pray that in all of the trials of life and all that the burdens we carry, that they might f be fleeting from our presence, from thy presence as we gaze upon the bleeding Lamb of Calvary and the risen Son of God. We pray that as we see our Boaz, who has come to our rescue and our aid, that we will be encouraged, no matter how heavy the burden is that we bear today. Come, Lord, in all thy fullness and power, let us know much of thy blessing upon us today. Let us know God in the midst of his people, God feeding his sheep, the Lord himself descending with mighty power. Oh, God, come, 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 dear God. Let us see thee and be blessed by thee. That our hearts may respond in love and devotion to Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I want you to bear in mind, beloved, as you read through any part of the Scripture, you're reading that which is written for our learning. Peter marks that out very plainly. These things are written for our learning, of course, referring specifically to the Old Testament Scriptures. And when we come to passages, therefore, that we may not fully grasp on first reading, 
and we may go over them and wonder, well, what on earth is that really saying? We must be careful that we're not bogged down by what we don't understand and find joy in what we do understand. It's not that there's anything wrong in mining out the difficult parts of Scripture and trying to uncover what they mean, but that we would get no blessing if we're distracted by the difficult and not focus upon the obvious blessings that the Lord is teaching to us. This passage, as the entire book of Ruth is showing to us, shows us the remarkable faithfulness and mercy of God toward His people, His covenant faithfulness toward those who are unworthy, and His purpose to redeem both Jew and Gentile in His own way. This little book, this little narrative, so full of dialogue, so full of sorrow, and yet so full of tremendous hope, is a means of helping us to see that no matter what happens in life, God will fulfill His purpose toward His people, and that those purposes are hopeful purposes, are encouraging purposes, and enable us to look at things that we don't understand and say, I know God has a purpose in all of this and He will bring it to be blessing on my behalf. On a practical level, the book shows us how God has instituted family as well as civil law in order to provide for the weak, for the poor, for the widow, for those who are most destitute within communities. We are told, and we've looked at this in the past, how that there was particular provision to be made, even with regard to those who owned fields, and in the time of reaping, they were to leave the corners of the fields, and any, perp- any handfuls of the, of the wheat or the barley that fell to the ground, they were not to lift again, but leave them to the poor who were following behind. This is the law of God. It was a law showing the generosity of those who have abundance. Like the Lord Himself, who is so full and so abundant in what He is able to give and continue giving without losing, the symbol of that is shown there in those who had wealth and had fields and had good harvests that they could leave behind even some and still have more than enough for themselves as others benefited from their sacrificial giving toward them. We are to learn from this. And many of the laws that we've been highlighting from this with regard to the laws uh, with the harvest and so on and providing for the needs of those who had not, uh, as well as the the, the laws that govern those who uh, were widowed and so on, that we've been looking at this and the provisions that were made with regard to having lost the land and one could could redeem the land if they were a near kinsman or how if you're uh, your husband had died and you were without any posterity that there was provision in the law that a brother would come along and, and continue on the family name. All of these provisions of the law show God's care for the poor and needy. And nothing has changed. The normal order is that either fathers or husbands provide for the needs of women. That's generally the natural order, but life doesn't always deliver normal, does it? And that's what we see in the book of Ruth, because here we're given the picture, the image, the example of two women, Naomi and Ruth, and they are not in the norm. They, they, they were, they had that. Naomi had a husband, but he's taken into eternity. Ruth also marries, moves away from her family, comes into Amari Malon, and yet again he is taken out, taken out into eternity, and she is found destitute and in want. And they both find themselves in great need, dire straits, and requiring mercy. And the point is this, God has provisions for them as he has today. We are to provide for our own. Generally, that is the responsibility of fathers providing for their husband or for their wives and for their children. Uh, and, and generally, that's the way it, it works. And, and we be this carry on of provision within the family context. But we see even that when things are different, you have uh, the woman needing to go out and make provision for themselves, having to go out and work. Such was the need of the present hour in which they found themselves. But the law of God is making provision. That's the encouraging thing. God has put things in His law to encourage, even when the normal circumstances, if we can use those terms, <laughs> when the norm isn't there, there's still support that comes from God's Word. And that's the case even 
to this present day, even according to New Testament scriptures. The New Testament deals with the needs of widows, doesn't it? It refers to them, I'm thinking of 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, and the need there, and the church, uh, if, if any, have you know, widows indeed there to provide for the widows. But it goes on and says, well, that the, 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 the general way in which widows are provided for is through uh, their own children, through their own sons and so on. They are to be the, the providers of the widow. And, and really what Paul is saying there in 1 Timothy 5 is saying, look, uh, take this on board. It's the responsibility of family to look after widows but when that's not the case, and you have widows indeed, that is widows who have no help and can turn to no one, or there's a refusal, refusal of those who are obligated to help in doing their part, then the church comes in. But the church isn't first and foremost a charity to those in need. That's, that's not the way the church is to function. That's not its primary focus. Indeed, what Paul is saying, the church's primary focus as the pillar and ground of truth is to, to get the truth so into communities so that sons know they have responsibility where there is need to look after their mothers if, if their fathers are gone out of the picture. And that young widows can remarry in order to again find provision and need in these times of life. These are the implications of the Word of God. God makes provision for the needy. And His Word tells us how we're to conduct our affairs and how we're therefore to be provided for. But there's one thing that can't be provided for by man, and that is the provision of the soul. That is the cleansing from sin. And everything that the law pointed to was showing that the blood of beasts and goats can never take away sin, to use the language of Hebrews 10. It can never deal with that problem. Whatever provisions may be made practically, this provision to be redeemed, to be delivered from sin, to be brought near to God, to have our sin put away fully, completely, finally, and have a sure hope of eternal glory, that must be done by one who we know was called Jesus and would save his people from their sins. Boaz, in many ways, represents the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been seeing that, and I want you always to see that. And there's many ways in which we can see that. But as we look at the verses 6 through to the end of Ruth chapter 3, we're considering here our, our main focus of attention in looking at these verses is Ruth's example of consecration. Ruth's example of consecration. Now, that may not be what you initially see when you read these verses. Maybe it wasn't what was on your mind when you were going through them as we read them together today. But that, I believe, is a central application that we are to learn here. Many practical applications, as we've noted, but the spiritual application that comes to our heart is that of the need to be consecrated to the Lord. Note with me then, first of all, her practice. Her practice. As she gives to us an example of consecration, what was her practice? Well, look at verses 6 and 7. And she went down onto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. Now, if you were here last week, I don't need to emphasize too much, but for those who were not, the opening five verses, uh, Naomi is giving instruction to Ruth, telling her what to do. And when you break down the verses, you find that there are eight commands, eight kind of sections of instruction given to her, what she's to do to wash and anoint and put raiment and go down and so on. Verse four, other, four other instructions given to her, what she is to do, what she is to follow. And we said last week, and I said again, that the whole purpose of these commands were to get her to the feet of Boaz. She needs to obey the word that she's giving. Now, I want you to bear in mind again what we said last week, that every, everything she is saying is stemming from the word of God. Her hope, her desire for her to be, for her daughter-in-law to be received by Boaz is based upon God's provision in the word, in the law. And so she has filled her heart with God's truth and she is hoping to see that word then come to fruition. And Ruth learns from that, the importance of keeping the word of God. Not long before them, when Joshua was living, he had made it very clear, even at the end of his life, the importance of heeding the word of God. Joshua chapter 23, when he's speaking to Israel, Joshua 23 verse 6, 
He says to them, Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left, that ye come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of their, the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them, but cleave unto the Lord your God, as ye have done unto this day. Keep the word of God before your eyes and do it. And he goes on, he shows his own example in, in the next chapter, doesn't he? when he says to them a tremendous challenge of verse 15 of Joshua 24, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And as these words echoed in the minds of the children of Israel, they ought to have been very aware of them, and I have no doubt that Naomi was aware of them. And Joshua's influence and his, his prevailing thought and lasting kind of words coming upon them, and of course the generation that rose up after Joshua forsook these things, turned away from them. But Naomi is being stirred in her heart. She has been revived in her faith, and she knows the law of God. And she has given instruction, therefore, to Ruth. And Ruth, as a child of God, as one fairly new in the faith, she wholeheartedly does everything, Naomi says. Everything. That's what verse 6 is saying, isn't it? She did according to all. Not that she just generally went about in a certain way, like she, she kind of, well, I'll go down to the floor but there's no real point in changing my clothes. I can't be bothered with that. Or I'll change, I'll wash and change myself, but I'll not anoint myself. Or there may be other things I may leave out. Maybe I'll not mark the place where he shall lie. Various things she could have left out. But right, Ruth obeyed everything. And beloved, that is the first mark of the example of Ruth's behavior here is that in her practice, she obeyed the word of God. No excuses. No turning around and saying, well, that maybe doesn't, she didn't really mean that. <laughs> She's using some kind of, uh, you know, Jewish cultural terminology there. Well, I'm from Moab, I don't need to do that part, but I'll, I'll do part of it. That's how many handle the Word of God today, isn't it? Uh, that they just turn everything to cultural practice. Oh, that's, that was cultural, that was the first century. Well, does the Word of God say what it says or does it not? And she had been very clear in her instruction, and Ruth knew she was clear, and she obeyed what she said. And child of God, that is your duty. You have no higher calling. <laughs> you have no higher calling than just do what God says to do. And what are you wanting? You want some you know, great responsibility? God may give it to you. You wanting to have some great prosperity? God may grant it to you. There are other things you desire. Look, look, and, and your privilege as a child of God in this house today, your highest honor is to obey the word of the living God. The very fact he condescends to communicate with you is a mercy that we should not take for granted. He is talking. He is communicating. And he is communicating today, reminding us from the example of Ruth that she is setting here a practice that we are to follow, obeying, the Word of God. Verse 7 goes on. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie at the end of the heap of corn, and she came softly and uncovered his feet. Clearly she's obeying it all, isn't she? And verse 6 is really a summary of all her actions that are, that are included here in all of these verses. But it gives a little detail. She was waiting there, just as she said, marking the place, and she came in and uncovered his feet and laid her down. Note then, not only her practice, but her place. Her place. It tells us in verse 8, And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. Notice that already at the end of verse 7. Uncovered his feet and laid her down. But notice here it makes it very clear. She didn't move herself away from his feet. She lay at his feet. And he notes this. Of course, it took him by surprise. <laughs> A little alarmed to realize that, that she's, somebody is there and he startles in the middle of the night at midnight. And 
Then, then he notes that there's someone right there at his feet. Before we go on any further in noting this place, I want you to, to get a hold of where she is. I hinted at it and dealt with it briefly last week, but let us, let us get this on board, beloved, this getting to the feet of Boaz. The place is emphasized, it's repeated here. I mean, Naomi is very clear in her instruction, get to his feet. Then we have it repeated there, uncovered his feet, lay at his feet. The Word of God is telling us something, isn't it? The, the Spirit of God is, 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 is getting something to our hearts and we're not to miss it. And that is our importance of being at the feet of our beloved. There's such an example set here that is carried throughout the Scriptures. Anything can happen when we get to the feet of our heavenly Boaz. Anything. Have you got sickness in the body? Get to his feet. Get to his feet. We read in Matthew 15, verse 30, great multitudes came unto Jesus, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet. And he healed them. He healed them. I am not saying, of course, and you know this, I'm not saying that Christ just heals everyone, and you just come and you present yourself and pray a prayer, Lord, heal me, and it will all go away. It doesn't work like that. But if you're going to be healed, if you're going to be healed by the Lord, what are you to do? Is any sick among you? Let him pray. Let him sing psalms. Let him be found at the feet of Jesus. Don't just go to the doctor. Go to the doctor. Do go to the doctor. Go and get whatever advice you may get. Someone knows something who can advise you. Go and talk to them. That's fine. But don't in all your searching for help avoid the feet of Jesus. The great healer. The one who can just touch us in a moment. Have you sin? Where are you to be? At his feet. At his feet. Luke 7, 37, 38. We have the example of that sinful woman. That unclean woman that Simon made almost a mockery of the Lord Jesus as if he didn't know who she was. But what do we read in Luke 7, 37 and 38? And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Oh, she didn't, she wasn't lame, she wasn't blind, she wasn't sick, she wasn't diseased. But she had sin. And where did she come to to have that sin dealt with? She came to the feet of Jesus. And she sat there as long as he was there. Oh, he, he, is, in, he is in close quarters. He's nearby. My Redeemer is nearby. I must run to his feet. I don't care that he's in the house of a Pharisee. I know before a Pharisee I might be seen as heinous and unclean and unwanted, but regardless of what Simon says, I will get to Jesus. I'll show my appreciation for the forgiveness of sins that he offers. Have your family dying in sin? It's not your sin you're more worried about, at least not exclusively, you're worried about the sins of others. They're dying in sin. What do you do? You get to his feet. You get to his feet. Mark 5, 22 and 23. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed and she shall live. Now she did die, didn't she? She died. But Christ spoke a word and she came to life again. And the point is this, beloved, that we have people around us who are dead. They're not just dying, they're dead. They're dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 verse 1. They're dead. What can we do? Take them to the doctor and try and fix them? No. And take them to some kind of moral pathway that might help them. Some course that might instruct them in some way of, of living a better life and turning over a new leaf. No! 
And again, there may be practical ways we can help them. And they may be enslaved by certain sins and addictions. And there may be certain courses out there that may contribute to their help. But in all of our seeking for help around us, make sure we're coming to the feet of Jesus. That's the point. Need support from God? Direction, counsel, guidance, help. Where do you go? You go to his feet. Like Mary, Luke 10, 39. Martha had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Yes, you see, Jesus came that time in Luke chapter 10. He didn't tell Martha that he wanted any food. He came to give spiritual bread to her to get through them all. And Mary knew that. She knew that. She knew that if the Lord was really there to be, have food or whatever, she would go and help. But she knew the Lord was there to communicate his word. And so she realizes, no, my place is to be at his feet, listening, just as it is your place and mine. All the commands, eight commands of instruction Naomi gave to Ruth, all designed to get her to the feet of Boaz. And if there's one instruction you could take to heart today, it is this, God is calling me to the feet of Christ. He is calling me to the feet of my Redeemer. He is calling me afresh to throw myself before Him for my own sin, for the sins of my loved ones, for sickness of body and myself or on others, or for some other problem that I don't know how to face and I need an answer to. Get to the feet of Jesus, child of God. Stop ignoring the most prominent place of Scripture where we get our ills dealt with by God's grace. Go to Jesus. Get before his feet. Stop ignoring it. And you know you're this morning if you're an ignorer of the feet of Jesus, don't you? You know it. You know if you can look back over the past week and say, I've ignored the feet of Jesus. I haven't been near his feet at all. Then you wonder why you come in here so cold. You wonder why life seems kind of burdensome. Well, of course you're carrying the burdens yourself, aren't you? You're not offloading them at the feet of Jesus Christ, are you? You're going to be more burdened Life's going to be more difficult, and you don't know the enjoyment of heavenly aid when you just throw it at the feet of the Lord. So that's our place. Thirdly, then, our proposal comes in verse uh, 9 again. Or verse 9, I mean. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. In this first section up to verse 13, this is the only uh, word that she speaks. The rest of the spoken word here is from Boaz. But this proposal that she brings, what was the merit upon which she brought it? Herself? No. Naomi sent her according to the word of God. We need a near kinsman. Boaz is a near kinsman. <laughs> it was telling us that, wasn't it? Before we ever saw Boaz in action, chapter 2, verse 1, is telling us by way of information that we are to keep in mind, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. He's a kinsman. He's a near family relative, and he can come and help us in our plight and poverty, not only with our spirit, our needs practically, but even with our needs relationally. He may pick up the responsibility to even marry Ruth at this time. The law of God made provision for her, and so she came in before him on the basis of the law of God. And of course, she is desiring deliverance. She, to put it another way, as it is in verse 1 of chapter 3, she's wanting rest. She's wanting rest. It was a burdensome thing to be a widow in Israel in those days, much more so than today. You were exposed to all manner of abuse, being from Moab, having no one to protect you or care for you. Not a nice place to be. And this is why Naomi is, is particularly burdened about this, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee. I'm looking after your welfare. And Ruth, you may go on, you may go on, and we may have to struggle through life this way, but there is another way. And the Word of God makes some hopeful provision for us. Things might turn around. Notice in this proposal how she identifies herself. I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Not Ruth the Moabitess. That's how she's been identified pretty much up until this point. She's Ruth the Moabitess. Others are called her Ruth the Moabitess. And this is how she's known. 
But when she identifies herself, when she comes before Boaz, she doesn't say, I am Ruth the Moabitess. She says, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Isn't that encouraging? Ruth is beginning to see she's different. Oh, in a very real way, she's still a Moabitess. She can never cast that off completely. But she is identifying herself as different too. She's not entirely what she once was. She is a different woman. She has been changed by grace. And she identifies herself as thine handmaid, thy servant. I lay myself before you as a servant of yours. I wonder, do you realize that you're a different child of God? There are some of you here, I know, maybe more than I'm even aware of, and you're enslaved by your past. You are. The past shackles you, and you think that you'll never break free from the past, and that you'll always be identified with maybe things you did in the past. And you may not even be able to break those habits of the past or those, those, those things that tarnish you from the past. Beloved, look, look at this. She sees herself not just as a Moabite, as thine handmaid. I'm your handmaid. She is not going to be shackled by being tied solely to Moab. Why? Because she has solely given herself entirely to follow the God of Naomi. And where you die, I will die. I am sold out, totally given over to worshipping the God of Israel. And Boaz, as he represents the authority figure here, she comes and says, Thine handmaid. Is that what you are before God? Before Christ? Can you say with a straight face and with all honesty, you can say, God, I am your servant. I'm your servant. I exist to serve you. I go to work first to serve you, second to provide. I do what I do around the home first for your glory, second then for all the practical things that are required within the home. Serving God. You need child of God. If you're enslaved and shackled by things in the past, you need to Put your faith in gospel promises that tell you that you're otherwise. <laughs> Beloved, now are we the sons of God. <laughs> now are we the sons of God. It wasn't always that way, but John says in 1 John 3, now are we the sons of God. So I'm still, in a sense, that nature's still there. And I wrestle with it every day, and there's a war in the, in the soul and with the flesh and all of that. But I am also now the sons of God. And I have even more to look forward to. For it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Not only how she identifies herself, but how she invites herself. She says, Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid. Hmm. And of course, people look at this and they're like, what is this? And they, they focus in on this and they miss the whole passage. They get nothing out of it except all sort of, sorts of distorted ideas. And, well, you know, maybe this was a practice or I mean, maybe it's a euphemism for some other thing. It means something else. It's kind of the Bible using uh, speech that's palatable to hide up something that's more unpalatable that we wouldn't want to just blatantly express. No, no, that's not it. Look, look, if you can't understand something, listen, listen, here, here's a little lesson in, in hermeneutics for you, in, in the interpretation of Scripture. If you can't understand something, instead of sitting there and guessing at it, here's an idea. Get out a concordance, or nowadays, pull out your iPhone, and do a little, put in the Google, KJV search. Look for something where you can search for a word and search for terms and words and things that are, are like what you're dealing with. Do a bit of study. Find out, is this mentioned anywhere else in which the context might be made more plain to me? Is it mentioned anywhere else that might help me to interpret what actually is being said here? And if you did that, in this case, instead of coming to all sorts of weird, modern, Bible-denying conclusions, you would find yourself, for example, in Ezekiel chapter 16. Turn over there for a minute, just to see this, just because the nonsense that you read when, when you're dealing with Ruth chapter 3. Now, I'm, I, I, I do not have time to go through Ezekiel chapter 16 with you. It's a long chapter, but it's a chapter of allegory, and it's an allegory of 
Jerusalem's unfaithfulness, Israel's unfaithfulness, uh, how, well, particularly Jerusalem, as it's mentioned there in verse 2, their unfaithfulness to the Lord. But it goes through a whole story in Ezekiel 16, how the Lord brought them. Look, for example, there at verse 4, As for thy nativity, in the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swatted at all. In other words, your existence at the beginning was, wasn't, even, wasn't even the normal kind of way. You weren't even treated, right? You were kind of ugly and, and, and left for dead, basically. Not I pity thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee, but thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. Verse 6, when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Hear God coming and through allegory saying what he would do for that smallest of people. He tells them over and over again, he didn't love them because they were greatest. They were smallest and despised. And yet his love was, was without merit. There they are, I passed thee by, I saw thee polluted in thine own blood. I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Verse 7, I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxen great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare, you have matured. I came and, you, and, and, and provided sustenance for you, and you matured. Now look at verse 8. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. What's it saying? The symbolic nature of spreading the skirt is this. It's the union of marriage. The Lord is saying when I passed by, and of course it's all allegory, it didn't, didn't happen literally speaking, but this is what happened in their history. They were nothing. And God came and spread a skirt over them, entered into covenant union with them. And all the blessings they enjoyed were as a result of that covenant union depicted here as a marriage. You can read on down, you see the allegorical language in there. Spiritual adultery away from the Lord which is really the point that he gets to, how they've turned their back. Spread the skirt. You see that though, verse 8. I spread my skirt over thee. I was taking you to be mine. It was a claim. It was a cultural way of saying, you're mine. I will marry you. Or I am married to you. And that's what she is saying. Ruth is coming before Boaz, sitting there at his feet, and she's saying, spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid. Boaz, marry me. That's my desire. Not just for you to redeem the land that was lost and give to us back our portion of the inheritance in the land. No, no, I want more. I want for you, I want for you to marry me. As was given the duty of a brother, but also it seemed to be the practice of those who, who were willing of near of kin that they too may marry those who were widowed and without any children. And this is her plea, this is her proposal. This brings us then, fourthly, to her prospect, last main point. Her prospect from verse 10 through to the end. And the basic theme of these words drive home the prospect that Ruth was hoping for, that Boaz would do the part of a kinsman. That's what verses 10 through to the end really uh, are, are teaching us at its heart, that Boaz would do what she proposed for him to do in verse 9. First of all, note here, it was a good prospect on the basis of his prayer. He says in verse 10, on res in response to what she has just said, look at what he says, blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. There's a prayer. There's a benediction. There's a desire that he is expressing toward Ruth. Having said what she said and made her proposal, she, he desires whatever else is going to come. And as we find out, there's another who's nearer of kin to her. But whatever comes, whatever happens, he is pronouncing a prayer, a benediction, a desire, a longing for her. Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. Be blessed. Be blessed. And from the language, when you read on down, he gives a reason for why this is so marvelous in his eyes. 
Thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. That is, in doing this, you're showing more kindness than you did ever in our initial meeting and so on. Inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And the question here is, is a few things. First of all, that Boaz was clearly older. And that Naomi was attractive and would have been appealing to many young men, whether rich or poor, in the area at that time. Of course, she had a testimony that was growing, and he brings that out in verse 11, of being a virtuous woman. And as her stature gained more credibility in Bethlehem, she became even more desirable. And so her willingness, and she could have had perhaps a pick of wealthy men around in some ways, but she wants to follow the law of God, the provision God has made. She's not going around choosing things after her own desire. She is going according to the word of God, and she desires to be given to Boaz, and, and this is a tremendous thing in his eyes. You see, he thought himself perhaps over the hill. All these young men, fit and strong, with their six packs and so on, I don't know. But here's old Boaz. What has he got in appeal to a young woman like Ruth? And he's encouraged by this. Encouraged and blesses her. You see, when I read through this, I thought about Isaiah 53. What it says about the Lord Jesus. It says in verse 2, He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. In outward, carnal ways, there's no beauty in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he walked among men and he walked among those of his own people. And there was no outward beauty to identify him as being special. And there was nothing particularly attractive over other individuals that were living at that time. There was no particular way that he was identified and become someone that everyone was drawn to. There was no form nor comeliness. There was no beauty that they would naturally desire Boaz feels that way. I have no natural beauty that would make me desirable. But you see, you see, like Christ, Boaz had something else to offer. And what we're to see here is what Christ offers, that carnally, carnally, there's no way I'd be attracted to Jesus Christ. But when I see the beauty that's really hidden in him, when I see that he is the answer for my plight as being poor and needy, as being poverty stricken with nothing to offer and no hope for the future and sin coming and condemning me and saying, you're for hell, sinner. Then when I see Christ, that he is the redeemer and deliverer, my, isn't there a beauty in him now? My sinful soul sees that God has set apart Christ to redeem his people. And I see there's the answer. My need isn't for someone of beauty, not for someone of great stature or wealth merely. I'm looking for someone who can deliver me from my plight, who can give rest. The rest spoken of there in verse 1, that it may be well with thee. An old sinner here this morning, that's why you must come to Christ. Not because being a Christian makes life all swell and a bed of roses, but because you have no other answer for your sin. Nothing. Not church attendance, not baptism, not religious deeds, not good works, not charitable efforts. Nothing. Nothing. You're separated from God. Your sin condemns you. And your only answer is Christ. And up until this point, he has been nothing to you. Nothing to you. You need to see how awful your sin is. Christ is the only deliverer. And when that's the case, there are no other options. There are no other desirables. It's not a short list of who I might go to for help. He is the only one. The way, the truth, and the life, exclusively for the sinner. The blessing of God, you see, does not come by following our hearts but by following the word of God. And that's why Boaz blesses her. She didn't follow her heart carnally. She followed the word of God. And the word of God had made provision, a kinsman. And she said, I'll go with the word of God. The word of God's made provision. And I'll trust the word of God. Not the fancies of my own heart. Not all these other young men perhaps showing me attention. I will follow the word of God. Yes. Would that more would take that to heart. Samuel Rutherford said, your heart is not the compass that God steers by. <laughs> your heart is not the compass that God steers by. Take that on board. In the philosophy of our humanistic ideology, follow your heart. Listen to that little inner voice. Follow your own ways. 
Be true to yourself. Not biblical. It has nothing to do with the Word of God. Nothing. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. My heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. It's my enemy. The only thing I can trust is the Word of God. And that's why Boaz is impressed. It's this young lady, full of virtue and tremendous beauty. She's not willing to follow her own heart. She's following the Word of God. You young people take that to heart. And your desire to find happiness in this life, whether it be in employment, location of life, marriage, whatever it might be, don't follow your heart, follow the Word. Follow the Word of God. I can make all sorts of application there. What does the Word of God say? Listen to your mother and father for a start. No unequal yoke. And other things. I just must leave there. For I've said it many times before. Your heart is not the compass that God steers by. No. Our hearts need the word to steer us into truth. So, it was a good prospect on the basis of his prayer. It was a good prospect on the basis of his promise. Because in verses 11 through 13, I'll not read it because time is almost gone, but there's a couple of things he says. Note, in verse 11 he says, I will do to thee all that thou requirest. There's a promise. And now in verse 13, he makes another promise. Then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee as the Lord liveth. So he, he, is, he is making a promise here. Of course, the caveat is this other near kinsman, if he's not willing to do his part, verse 12 there. But providing that he's not willing to do that, then I make a promise to you. And so he makes his promise to her. Just as Boaz reflects here, Christ took on the responsibility of seeking to redeem his people. He was willing to do it, no matter what the cost. Then thirdly, in this point, see, it was a good prospect on the basis of his provision. In verses 14 through 18, he gives provision, doesn't he? Now, before we get into that, uh, you look at verse 14. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. Uh, and there's some interpret that again. They're thinking, well, they had something to hide. But they haven't done anything improper, beloved. Don't, don't allow those thoughts to come into your mind. She's virtuous. He's virtuous. The chances are there are others that maybe even took notice of this. Some of the servants that were nearby, maybe. We're not told that. But they may. The general outsider is making some provision here of, of the preservation of her testimony, of his testimony too. And the application basically is this. There are times that we have to act purely for the sake of Christian testimony, not because we're actually doing something impure. We need to do something for the sake of testimony, regardless of our interpretation of Christian liberty, because they may have argued, well, we're at liberty, you know, we're not doing anything wrong here, but they endeavored to do something above and beyond what was necessary just to preserve our testimony. And that's, that's important, you see. Christian liberty gives me the right to elevate the testimony of the gospel above my own desires, Christian liberty does not get me the liberty to do what I please. It gives me the liberty to do what I need to do to elevate the importance of the gospel. That's Christian liberty, truly. I wish people would take that on board more than they do. It is impossible to know the amount that's given here. When he says in verse 15, bring the veil. It gives six measures, you'll note, if you have an authorized version. It measures is in italics, so it's not there in the original. It's six of barley. Six what? We don't know. Anybody who says, or a number who try to say what's here, uh, it's, it's, it's basically guessing. I mean, no way of absolutely knowing. But clearly it was a lot. Because he fills up this veil, and I think he would have filled it as much as it could contain, or as much as she could carry. And he lays it on her. Somehow wraps it around her or something, in such a way that she can carry it. But we, we can hazard a guess that it's a lot. And the point of the verse is to show Boaz's generous nature. That's it. It's not to try and find, well, how much is it and what does that mean? The point is this. He is generous. And he is showing forth his willingness to provide. And he's indeed, I would say here, because going by the language that we don't have in the, in the initial narrative, but when she tells the story, that is when Ruth tells the story, 
uh, in verse 17, she said, These six measures of barley give he me, for he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. There may have even been there a message being sent to Naomi. Naomi, if I do this, you'll be looked after as well. The abundance you see of Boaz, the abundance to look after those who are in need. And of course, what's remarkable in this is, in a moment we'll just bring this to a close, is that Naomi, Naomi is not concerned about the barley that he has brought, or she has brought, and he has given. Not concerned about it at all. Because in verse 18 she says, Then she had, said she, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. She doesn't care about the barley at all. She is looking to the long-term provision. The very way it began right there in chapter 3, verse 1. Shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? There's a future in view. Not just of enough barley to get us through a few weeks, but sufficient to get us through every need in the rest of our existence. <laughs> yes. And we need to think that way too, don't we? Christ's great provision is for the eternal needs, future needs that sinners really need as well as the present. I think all of this, as we tie this up, is, is a wonderful picture of consecration. Ruth just bringing herself to Boaz in complete obedience to the word, following every instruction, and then the outworking of that consecration flowing from Boaz's desire to help her and do what he is able to do. He gives her, she gives herself without reservation. And that is our Christian duty. It is. Give yourself without reservation to our heavenly Boaz. If Christ is the hope for the poor and needy, and the sinner who has nothing to offer, if we see ourselves as such, we are to do as Ruth, Ruth did. We are to throw ourselves at the feet of Boaz. That's it. And what bothers me, what bothers me about myself and about you, as I close this, is the fact that some of you aren't consecrated to the Lord. You're not. You're not. Because you hold back, you hold back time, you hold back your talents, you hold back your tithe, if you use it in that kind of word, just for all the T's. You hold back these things. You're, 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 you're dealing with God on your own terms. When you make decisions, it's not about what would God have me to do, it's about what's convenient for me. How tired am I? That's what you're thinking about. How tired am I tonight, whether I go to church or not? It's about how tired I am. If I'm tired, well, forget it. That's not consecration. You don't understand consecration. Consecration throws yourself at the feet of the master. I am thine handmaid. Give the word and I'll go. Any hour of the day, any moment of time, anything you say, I will do without reservation, without any holding back. I don't think many of us know anything about it. And yet it is the great call of Paul, isn't it? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you twiddle your thumbs in church and play church for the existence of your life. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you make sure you pay a little bit into the church, but live life how you please. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you just kind of drift along. Never share the gospel. Never pray for souls. Never pray for the work of God. Never cry for revival. Never set aside an afternoon to pray with the people of God that God will show us mercy in the midst of the judgment that's coming more and more upon us. No, no. Christ in your terms. But Paul says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies. A living sacrifice. Holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. May we learn from Ruth's example and do the same today. Let's bow together in prayer.